the fallout is, is still being felt from that Delaware race. Take a look at this. This is fascinating. This is Senator Jim DeMint and then Senator John Cornyn with their takes on what happened on Tuesday in Delaware. I've been in the majority with Republicans who didn't have principles. And we embarrassed ourselves and lost credibility in front of the country. Frankly, I'm at a point where I'd rather lose fighting for the right cause than win fighting for the wrong cause. If the Democrats think that the Tea Party folks are mad at Republicans, just wait till they see what happens when uh, November the 2nd comes around and they get a shot at the uh, Democrat incumbents. Of course, those two men on different sides of, of the Same developments party. on Tuesday. Same party. Different planet. All right. Well, joining <laughs> us to talk about that, of course, for Post Politics, Karen Tumulty, who had this on the front page today, discussion about Delaware. Karen, what is going on, uh, not just in Delaware, but nationally? And what do we think it means? Well, I think that the uh, I think the Tea Party movement, which of course has uh, created any number of surprises this primary season, essentially sent the national Republican establishment a really big, loud message, which is you are not in charge. Here. Why did it take them that long? Was it, didn't they send the message a long time ago? Didn't yeah. it start in Kentucky and but, Nevada? And but none of at that point, you know, at no point did they give away what had appeared to be a nearly sure thing for the Republican Party. That is what is very different about Delaware. I mean, it was not only that they were likely to win that seat, but that that was Joe Biden's seat. Right. That was one of the seats that John Cornyn used to go around referring to as his trophy seats, along with Barack Obama's and Harry Reid's. So it was, you know, it was more than it was a more than just a, a you know, race. It was a stick in the eye. And this notion that Jim DeMint talks about, and he, elsewhere in that interview with John Carl, he said, I'd rather have 40 Marco, Marco Rubios than than, uh, than 60 Arlen Specters. This seems to have taken over a good portion of the Tea Party, but what is Jim DeMint's play here? This is a fascinating man to watch. He says he's not interested in leadership, but he's right. going to have all of these little junior demints that are joining us. <laughs> junior demints. <laughs> I, um, I love junior demints. They're, they're tasty. <laughs> I saw they're tasty. that they're tasty. Seinfeld <laughs> episode. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, you know, I think it's interesting because normally when people get to Congress, they come in with a lot of loyalty for the party machinery and for the leadership because these are the guys who campaigned with them and gave them money and helped them get there. The, you know, if we don't know how many of these Tea Party candidates are going to be elected, but whoever does get there, they're going to feel a lot more loyalty, I think, to Jim DeMint than they do to Mitch McConnell. Right. And we'll see, though, at some point, though, and I think Mitch McConnell's been very smart about going in very early on, right after Joe Miller won, for example, made sure that the apparatus was up there helping. But how many of these people, though, I mean, you see them when they're on the trail and then they make the transition to Congress. How many of these folks, they do on the trail say I'm anti-establishment, then they get here and they get to be part of the machinery? I mean, do you expect that to happen or do you think it's going to be much more difficult for them to be sort of woven in to you Washington? Know, I, I do think that there is something different about these candidates because they have been so explicit taking after their own party, unlike, I think, say, the class of 94, or I think the close, Dick Armey says that the, the closest equivalent might be the members who were elected in 1992, mm. uh, which was the same year that Ross Perot first ran, right. that these really were much more iconoclastic. Interestingly enough, one of the first things that they helped do was engineer the ouster of Bob Michael, right. the right. genial, longtime Republican leader in the House, and replacing him with Newt Gingrich. That group, right. of course, also included Rick Lazio, who uh, had a different right. result uh, <laughs> earlier this week. Uh, I want to ask you about this tax fight. It, it, to me, it's just it's it's remarkable that we're that we're going to see this play out here. It is, do, you, do you see a scenario where this is actually going to remain unresolved up to the election? Is that just a, a nightmare for Democrats? You know, I can't imagine it. And to me, I mean, as much as is Minority Leader Boehner's comments, as much attention as they got on Sunday, it just seemed to me like he was sort of stating the political reality Obviously. here for. For Republicans, he reminded me sort of of a quarterback who sees himself at the end of the game ahead, so he just starts falling on the ball. <laughs> but but this is if they, if this is unresolved though, this is just going to linger out there. We're seeing a lot of divisions among Democrats. They don't know how to handle this. The president is saying this is the Republicans holding up, but good number of Democrats are uncomfortable with this. And with each passing day, more of them it appears. So again, the longer this goes on, you could make the argument the worse it's going to get for the Democrats. Yeah, I mean we're already seeing the divisions, not just the, with. Democrats saying they're not going to vote for it, but you, you saw the, at the caucus meeting the other night, pollsters coming in and saying it's a winning issue for us. 
our taxes in, in an environment like this, do you see that, that this tax fight is going to be a winner fundamentally for Democrats? Well, of course, the last time they brought in the pollsters to talk to a caucus, I believe it was the pollsters they brought in to talk to the Senate Democrats about the health care. <laughs> so, How's that going uh, so yes. far? Yeah. Speaking of health care, wow. Did, did you see this play out? No Democrats running ads on this. It's just not out there at all. Well, to the degree you hear anybody talking about it, any Democrats on the campaign trail, it's the ones who are bragging that they voted, that they voted against, against it. it. Yeah, that's that's, right. <laughs> that's sort of the balance of this. And the big day coming up for the White House on that, but uh, unlikely that it's going to change the politics substantially before the end. Karen Tumulty, Post Politics, Washington Post. We appreciate you being with us. Check out our page, our front page story today on this very topic. That's right. That does it for this edition of Top Line. For Amy Walter, I'm Rick Klein. What do you think, man? I don't, I don't know, man. I'm going to miss Dude. Joe Biden if he's ever, I don't know, man. you know. You, 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 always, I love that the, that the vice president gets to go out there and respond to these election results, too. You saw, you remember in, in 2006, it was Cheney responding to Lieberman. Now it's Biden coming out.